is um, it really is uh, made up of ten distinct and different programs. There's federal land acquisition, which they call CORE, at both at the Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, and the Forest Service. There are emergency recreational access funding. There are state grants, including um, Forest Legacy, uh, Fish and Wildlife Section, Section 6, which deals with um, in, endangered species habitat. Uh, the American Battlefield Protection Program is part of the LWCF, and the Highlands Conservation Program, which is focused in uh, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, is also part of LWCF. We often, or I often joke that it's a, this program is like a Swiss army knife, right? It's got so many different tools in it, tools which can be used to solve local problems, community problems, um, states problems, or, or advocates problems, uh, whether those are access, whether that's trail improvement or creation, um, or it's, it's simply um, straightening out the patchwork quilt of land ownership across our country. So, um, and then the last thing I will note is that the um, Land and Water Conservation Fund, that $900 million a year is split equally between these federal side programs and what are referred to the state side or the grants to the state's programs. Um, and those are big numbers. That, you know, what does that mean? A billion dollars a year is awfully, it's awfully big and sometimes hard to wrap our heads around. Um, and so what I thought I would do is actually give a couple of examples of how the Swiss Army knife of the Land and Water Conservation Fund has been used and continues to be used to solve problems. Um, and so I'm gonna start with sort of the bigger picture project and work, work, work my way down. So next slide, please. Um, the first example I wanted to use um, is the Bonneville Shoreline Trail in Utah, which uh, Todd and I and, and, and Aaron have worked closely on um, to protect and help finish the Bonneville Shoreline Trail. Um, this trail is envisioned a nearly 300 mile trail that stretches the will eventually stretch from the uh, border between Utah and Idaho south past um, Utah Valley and south of Provo and Orem. Um, but to date, only about 100 miles is completed. Um, one of the big challenges with the Bonneville Shoreline Trail is that its alignment currently runs right along the boundary between the Wasatch Cache National Forest and the um, communities that are all along the Wasatch Front. That also means, though, that 85% of the population of Utah live within an hour's drive of the Bonneville Shoreline Trail. That is more than 3 million people who have access to, to, the, to the trail. Um, but uh, but that, that alignment presents real challenges. Recently, the Trust for Public Land, it's hard to see this map because it's a little bit small, um, but we did an, an analysis and, and identified more than 1,500 private property parcels that the proposed trail alignment would cross. Using basic real estate data, that means that if we wanted to purchase all of those 1,500 parcels to complete the trail, it would cost $555 million at a minimum. That's a half a billion dollars. Um, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, pie in the sky. That's not super feasible. But the Land and Water Conservation Fund can be a tool to help solve some of these problems, to, make, to uh, hone in on particular parcels, to connect portions of the trail that have already been cre um, created, um, but it also can inform the Forest Service as we think about potentially realigning the trail to avoid all of those private property conflicts. We're excited that um, since the early 90s, the Trust for Public Land has completed more than three dozen projects up and down the, the, the Bonneville Shoreline Trail. And, um, and as I mentioned, over the next 20 years, we hope to uh, do even more of those and complete the trail and the vision of the, of the BST. Um, so that's a big picture one, 300 mile long, the full length of the Wasatch Front. Um, next slide, please. Another example though, um, is up in Oregon. And this is a project called Spence Mountain. Spence Mountain is a really picturesque place right on the shores of Klamath Lake, just north of Klamath Falls in, in southern, South Central Oregon. Um, Spence Mountain is an area that's been privately owned for generations. Um, and in fact, already has a series of uh, single, single track mountain bike trails built through it. They're popular destination um, for mountain bikers. And there's a pretty robust um, mountain biking uh, industry or, or a couple of shops there in Klamath Falls, which is a relatively small place. Um, unfortunately, recently the owners of this area proposed to sell it off to a developer to develop a resort, a luxury resort, including lakeside cabins, golf courses, 
and um, some working forests, and it would have been shut off, and these mountain bike trails would have been um, closed down. So the city of Klamath Falls, together with the Trust for Public Land and other local partners, we've worked and we've secured LWCF funding to purchase Spence Mountain. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago in the president's budget, the last piece of that puzzle came through as a forest legacy program um, grant that will complete the purchase of Spence Mountain, stopping the development of that luxury resort and ensuring that this is a destination, um, uh, mountain bike destination that will benefit the economy of that small rural town there at Klamath Falls. Um, next slide, please. And then the last one I want to talk about is just a little bit about connectivity. And this one is smaller. Down in, down in Tucson, right adjacent to Tucson is Saguaro National Park. Um, in the map here, you can see that recently the Trust for Public Land worked with some landowners and these small orange parcels in the center of that map. There are three parcels and they represent just 84 acres, very small. But by purchasing and conserving those three small parcels, we've completed a land bridge between the Sweetwater Preserve, which is a Pima County project uh, park and the Saguaro National Park, linking together what is about 25 miles worth of trails in the Sweetwater Preserve with all of the trails in the National Park. And so that very small purchase using LWCF funds has opened up an incredibly big uh, complex of trails and, co and connected them together. Um, next slide, please. John. And so those are some of the examples of federal funding go and land acquisition going to help connectivity, help to preserve places where there are existing trails and help to help complete the vision of some of these big trails across the country. The other side of the Land and Water Conservation Fund is the state side, um, also called the state and local assistance programs. Those are formula grants that go to states. Um, they require a 50-50 match. And most importantly, those are informed by the State Conservation and Outdoor Recreation Plans or the SCORP, which we are gonna talk about in just one moment. But more recently, um, in addition to the state side formula grants, uh, a new program called the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program, which are competitive grants to urban programs have been, that's been established. Recently, that was increased from 25 million to 125 million. And there is a current grant application round out there for those ORLP grants. Those, can, those are generally targeted to underserved or historically underserved in urban communities, but they can include uh, trails, bike trails, connectivity between urban parks and connecting urban parks up to the um, to public lands as well. And I'll just use as an example of that, I mentioned the Bonneville Shoreline Trail at the, at the start. Um, so in addition to those federal LWCF dollar, dollars used to complete the trail, the state of Utah has earmarked $5 million of their LWCF stateside allocation for the Bonneville Shoreline Trail. And so together the federal and stateside pieces are working, um, working hand in hand. Um, and so with that, I've hit my five minutes um, and, I like, and I'll pass it over because it's important to note that to, to really access many of those stateside grants, the states, um, each individual state, often through the Department of uh, DNR or the Parks and Rec Department, they utilize that money and that is based on their SCORP. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our colleague here, Laurel Harkness. Laurel's a former uh, California Regional Director for IMBA and is currently the Executive Director of the Society of Outdoor Recreation Professionals. And she's gonna to talk to you about SCORP. Laurel, hand the baton to you. <laughs> thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's, it's great to be back with all my mountain biking friends. So um, yeah, in a different role. So, um, so SCORPS, yeah, so the SCORP isn't like the direct funding component, but, you know, as Mike kind of laid out, it's, it's tied into the LWCF program. So, and I think the thing to note around SCORPS is that, and LWCF is that this is, this is not a new program, right? This is, LWCF has been around over 50 years and, you know, related to that, SCORPS um, have been produced. So statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plans have been produced, um, you know, for, for decades as well. And every state, does their SCORP differently. <laughs> so, um, so to sort of formulate how to advise you on how to engage with your SCORP planning, you know, there's every state and territory does it differently. So there's a range of states, there's a, a range of planning budgets. And for the most part, I think everybody understands that um, states right now are facing deficits uh, within their um, sort of parks agencies. And it's typically the parks agencies that are tasked with producing the SCORPS. So 
Um, so just a couple framing things too. So the LWCF Act is the law. Uh, and then there's the LWCF manual that offers guidance about the SCORP and what needs to be in it and the administration of the program. So I put a couple of links in the chat there just to, um, for reference points. So um, and for the most part, the program in general provides each state with the maximum opportunity and flexibility to develop and implement its SCORP. So if you go prowl around in the different SCORPs across the different states, you're going to see a wide range of um, comprehensiveness, if you will. But there's a few basic components that are required with a SCORP. And you know, one of them being that there needs to be an evaluation of the demand for and supply of outdoor recreation resources. And there also needs to be a program for the implementation of the plan. So, all right, so how do you engage? So here's some strategies, very high level, and I'm gonna just whiz through this um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to, to take questions at the end or, or, or follow up later. But um, basically, you know, do your research first, you know, be a good partner, read the current SCORP, you're going to get clues on past community engagement, who's been, you know, what agencies or groups or local governments have been engaged in the past. Um, SCORPs need to be updated every five years in order for states to be eligible for their, um, their state and local assistance funding. So you, you'll be able to understand what the planning time frame has typically been with the previous version of the SCORP. And so that'll give you a clue as far as when that state might be kicking off its, um, its planning for the next round uh, of Updates. Get to know your key players as well. So every state has a state liaison officer that is assigned to be the link between the state and the park service that administers the LWCF program. There's a, you typically a, a SCORP planning lead, so a recreation planner um, that's, you know, tucked within the state agency. A lot of times they have a job that's outside of planning. So when SCORP planning comes around, they have to wear two hats at once. So typically overworked and under-resourced and sort of siloed. There's also... Um, like a park service regional rep a lot of times that is a good person for you to at least know who that individual is uh, to, to interface with. And then uh, it, in larger states, a lot of times the LWCF program, the grant part of the program is administered in a different division than uh, like the state parks or the, or, the, or, the, or the planning division. So planning and grants might be in separate departments. So, so um, understand you know, who's, who's in which, which place. And then also, um, you know, get to know your grant guidelines. A lot of times those are tucked within the SCORP. A lot of times they're separate, uh, but understand the open project selection process uh, because there, is op there are opportunities to um, inform the, um, the grant guidelines. And so that will have some, some implication for, for mountain bike advocacy groups. And then also just generally assess um, you know, the return on investment, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process to try to seek LWCF funds. Um, you've got to weigh that against the landscape of other funder, funding opportunities, what your projects are, um, and just, you know, make a decision based on your own capacity, whether this is worth pursuing. Um, aligning with eligible sponsors. So, um, so nonprofits cannot apply directly for LWCF um, funding. It has to be through state and local and tribal governments. So, um, so you've got to have relationships with these um, these local governments, and as they are the, they are the the ticket to to funding for trails projects under under LWCF. Um, cultivating regional partnerships. So again, uh, this is you've you've got to create an ecosystem that is key in in sort of community level project scoping, planning, and prioritization. And and this this ecosystem of regional partners will be. Uh, also key at implementation. And, and I, I, I strongly advise you to um, invest in regional partnerships. Um, they do require care and feeding, but I think in, in the long term, um, they, they make for an attractive community to invite funding, not just from LWCF, from other, but from other um, federal or, or, or state funding sources. So, um, and then uh, can you generally raise awareness for LWCF? You know, you'd be surprised. A lot of Local government folks and and park admins they do not know what LWCF is. They sort of they've heard of it, they recognize the acronym, but because it's been a chronically underfunded program, um, many local governments just really have no idea what the program is. So so to Mike's point, you know, like what is it? Ninety eight percent of counties have been funded. 
through LWCF, familiarize with what projects and, and facilities within your own community have been funded, educate, you know, also come up with a short list of what you may see in the future, you know, a short list of proposed projects and incorporate that into your sort of education campaign, if you will. And then just generally show up and do the work. I mean, we, we all do this. I mean, you're mountain bike advocates. You've just, you've been doing this for decades and, you know, planning folks, especially at the state level, they're isolated, they're overworked, and they're really appreciative of strong and reliable partners. So be a helper, be a doer, planning processes are, are lengthy. And so don't just show up to one meeting and, and you know, think that that's going to be enough, like be, be there, you know, through the whole process. Um, uh, next slide. So kind of just stepping it up to um, the next level here. So, um, so I know that there's varying capacities within the mountain bike advocacy groups. And so again, if you um, are serious about, you know, pursuing, you know, high levels of engagement with SCORPS um, and, and relationships with the, the state partners producing them. So, you know, if you've, if you've got nothing better to do, go ahead and look at other SCORPS in other states, um, you can identify um, desired language or goals that could serve to advance mountain biking. And I think IMBA is a great partner in, in being able to, to, to do this. Um, I, I think that there are some, some great examples in, in some states that, that could be pulled. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel in a sport planning process. And so you know, having sort of a, a, an inventory of, of language, if you will, um, you know, when, you, when you get into the sport planning process is good. So um, funding is, is an issue. There's a one-to-one -one match requirement uh, you know, for, for LWCF um, state local assistance funding. Um, you can, use, for the most part, you can't use federal um, funding sources, but you can use RTP and you can use block grant funding. So good to be aware of. Um, there's a real tricky piece in the timing of uh, LWCF um, funding. Uh, there's, there's land acquisition component of LWCF and a lot of times there's land transaction that has to happen, but you've got to line up your match funding. So uh, it's, it's, it's complex. And so do your homework and, you know, I would advise you to develop a relationship with a high capacity land trust at either the state or federal level. And a good example of that is the, the conservation fund. They can help to um, sort of bridge the gap, if you will, the timing gap between when match funding may be available and when LWCF funding is available. Um, another uh, source of, of match funding, and I would advise you is that now with, with a permanently and, and fully funded LWCF program, you know, this is play the long game. Just know that opportunities are going to be there in future years as well. And so make a case to create a use tax within your community. If you're, especially if you're in a, a natural amenity community, I think the timing is really good um, to make a case for, um, for introducing a use tax that can be um, dedicated to sustainable outdoor recreation, trails, equity, tourism, that kind of thing. Package it up, however, is locally relevant. So this is this is getting, you know, it, again, this, this takes some capacity to pursue all these things. So um, so partnering on SCORP implementation. So the planning is one thing, but the implementation is another thing. And I think for the most part, because there's a short turnaround on the planning, so only five years in between uh, uh, SCORP uh, updates, uh, I think the, the SCORP planners are continually frustrated in that they feel like there's they finish one plan and then they have to go right into the planning process for the next update and there's not enough time or energy or capacity to actually implement these really great things that come out of the SCORP. And so if you are presenting yourself as a, an implementation partner to be able to take the goals and objectives as they're outlined in the SCORP and infuse them into your, your communities, your you know, and, and the project level, um, I, I think that'll be good. It'll go a long way. It's, it's relationship building is what it is. So, um, and then developing state legislative champions. I think a lot of you already have relationships with your own state representatives. And again, getting back to kind of the education campaign and raising general awareness for LWCF, a lot of state local, uh, state elected leaders don't know what the LWCF program is. So just generally, let them know what it's about, educate them about the fact that there is a SCORP and those relationships with those state elected leaders can help in oversight of the program, accountability. Um, those state elected leaders also have influence over the local governments that, that who, who are the ones that will likely be the, the project applicants, um, you know, with a with trails component in there. And then also, 
um, there's, there's probably going to be a need for continued advocacy for funding of the SCORP plans in general and SCORP implementation and, and overall um, recreation budgets. And so, uh, you know, as advocacy um, organizations, you can advocate more than just the, the, well, the, the state staff can't advocate for funding for their own departments so much. And so you can be a good partner in championing with some of these, these um, legislative leaders and, and trying to get um, resources in support of the LWCF um, administration in, in your state. So, and I think, um, you know, celebrating LWCF project successes. Um, I, I think that you all do a good job of, um, of celebrating trail successes. It's important to sort of perpetuate the, um, the long-term success of the program. Um, LWCF, you know, and, and the Great American Outdoors Act, while it was supported in a bipartisan way, I think there's still some detractors a bit and there's, there's, there's gonna be scrutiny on the, on the program in general. And so the more we can do to, um, to, to celebrate you know, the, the projects that are going on locally, um, I, I think will help things. And so um, celebrate locally, but also feed it up to the LWCF coalition because I know that they really appreciate having um, stories on the ground that they can share with um, congressional leaders so that, because uh, I think there will be continued um, advocacy for increases in funding um, in addition to the $900 million a year that has been allocated. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna take a breath now and that's that's about it on SCORPS. Um, you know, just do the homework and, and start there and then I'm happy to, to help um, fill in any gaps if, uh, if, you, if you have questions or, or um, are, are having trouble locating the right people within your, your state, um, I can certainly help direct you through my work with the Society Outdoor Recreation Professional. So, um, so next up, I'm going to hand it off to Fletcher Jacobs. Um, he's with Colorado State. He's going to talk through the recreational trails program. And as I mentioned, RTP funds can match LWCF funds at the um, at the state and local assistance level. So, um, take it away, Fletcher. Awesome. Thank you, Laurel. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're sitting. Uh, my name is Fletcher Jacobs with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and I think as the initial email that went out about this called it the confusing alphabet of acronyms. So RTP, Recreational Trails Program, um, is what I'm gonna hit. And as this very helpful slide that Imba put together kind of outlines it very well, um, these are dollars that start with our partners of Federal Highways um, Administration, um, get sent to the states and then hopefully find their way to, can find their way to nonprofit organizations. Um, so I think that's a good way to visualize it. Go ahead, John, for the next slide, please. So big picture RTP, um, you can read the slide, it's off-highway vehicle use taxes. So I hope, it looks like a lot of you who are on camera are sitting down. Occasionally, um, we do have some trail users who don't always get along. So I think this is an, a great opportunity to remind folks, um, RTP comes from our OHV users. So if you're an OHV user out there, thank you so much uh, for helping pay into the system. And if you're not, um, next time, think about that uh, when you're, you're partnering with one of your OHV clubs or, or run by them out in the trail, um, give them a little thank you. So these are off-highway vehicle use taxes that get generated and get put back out to the state. Um, there is a federal highways, excuse me, administration formula that I believe Todd's gonna actually touch on a little bit later um, as part of the legislative updates. But basically it's a user pay, user benefit model um, you can see how much, you know, the program started in 1991 and just under 25,000 um, total funded project nationwide. In fact, I bet it's over that now um, and 1.47 billion in projects funded um, actually get out on the ground. And so right now it's around $84 million um, that is allocated nationwide. So each state doesn't get that. It's $84. And then the formula kicks in. So for instance, Colorado received about 1.6 million last year, just to give you a sentence, again, based off kind of the user, user uh, generated tax. Uh, go ahead, John, next slide, please. So how does the funding work? Um, so again, project sponsors, you apply to the state. And I see I actually, for some reason, the, the slide there is showing a, a little, uh, double up, but one of the things that I think is important to realize with this funding is it is eligible for not just state and local like LWCF, but is actually also eligible for federal partners and nonprofits. So nonprofits for most states can apply directly for this money. Um, you do have to apply to your state and I've got a, my final slide, we'll talk about this, but 
spoiler alert, reach out to your state administrator to start this process early. Um, have this conversation if you're not familiar with RTP, which it sounded like based on the, the stats we heard at the beginning there, maybe not everybody on this call is. Definitely reach out, find your state administrator because each um, state is gonna have a lot of flexibility with how they administer the program. So um, project sizes vary as it says, you know, some states have a minimum, um, some have a maximum. I know for us, uh, our maximum amount is $250,000. We don't have a minimum here in Colorado. Um, it is important to know it's a reimbursable cost share. So you do the project work up front, get reimbursed later. And then in general, again, can vary by state, but it's a little bit easier than LWCF dollars where you can get a 80% federal share, just come in with a 20% match. So a little bit um, easier to go there. So John, next slide, please. So this gives you a sense, this is kind of the, the latest numbers that Federal Highways has out there on their website. This is where the money has went. That's the, the pie chart uh, that you see there. I, I know I've missed in the, the last 15 months not being able to travel. I don't get my fair share of pie charts since I don't get to see USA Today's in uh, hotel rooms. So wanted to make sure you guys saw a pie chart of where that money kind of goes. So you can see maintenance, 35% of the money traditionally has went there. Um, that trail side, trailhead facilities, 26%. Um, construction, obviously a big a big chunk of it as well. And you can see a couple of those smaller slices of the pie. So you can get equipment. Um, acquisition is eligible for RTB funding, um, as well as assessment of trail, uh, the conditions. And then a really cool thing I think about RTP is they actually, uh, they, they put a cap on it, but you can use money specifically for education. I know that's something here in Colorado. We have done quite a bit for, for our funding. So next slide, John. So I think one thing that's super important here with this to remember is, uh, you know, how do I get the money, right? That's, that's the question everybody's really asking. So go ahead, John, next slide. So the big takeaways I would get everybody is contact that state administrator. This link right here, and I'll make sure we drop it in the chat, um, is how you find your state's administrator. So get in there, talk to them. Again, I'm representing Colorado here. Um, if you, I can tell you, in detail out of the way we use the money, but it's gonna be different if you're sitting in Maine, if you're sitting in Alaska, you're gonna to to reach out, get specifically um, your timelines, how your grant categories come together for your specific state. Um, each state to access this money must have a recreational trails committee. And kind of following up with something Laurel said there about getting involved with SCORP, this is a way if you're not familiar with this money, reach out to your state administrator and ask about the Recreational Trails Committee, how you can come to one of the meetings. Um, by law, those you know, the committees have to meet at least once uh, per the, the federal fiscal year. Um, I know several states, including Colorado, we meet four plus times a year, um, depending on the topics we have to discuss. And this committee has to be made up of non-motorized and motorized users. Um, one thing that I you know, kind of joked over at the very beginning, you know, this is OHV, off, you know, it's off highway vehicle fuel use tax, but by law, the money has to go 30% to motorized trails, 30% to non-motorized trails, and then 40% of it can be used for diversified or multi-use trails. And each state gets, is in control of that diversified, what it means for their state. So for instance, here in Colorado, we put some of that diversified money to our snowmobile program. My partner, Mickey, down in Arizona, not spending quite as much, right, for the snowmobile program. So it might be an opportunity for some of their diversified funds to, you know, help out with um, multi-use trails that are also open, open to mountain bikers. So really good to reach out, kind of understand how that committee is viewing that, come to those meetings, be involved. In fact, maybe become a committee member. So the other other portion, I think Laurel put that in her extra credit as well. Um, it is a great idea to jump on and actually look at the RTP database to see projects. You know, I, for instance, we've had 511 projects here in Colorado. You can look and see, all right, well, recently, what is the State Trails Committee uh, put forth at, for funding for RTP projects? You can get a sense of, here's some of the mountain bike projects, here's what's scored well. You can get in there, get some more information. Um, around those projects. And then finally, consider youth core involvement. It's actually written into the, the latest version of the legislation that we are highly encouraged as states um, to use this RTP funding um, to work with youth cores, bring them out again, maintenance. You saw over the course of time, over a third of this money has went into maintenance. A lot of that ends up being youth core crews going out to work. So certainly something to think about engaging with them. So that's a lot for a very quick overview of, of RTP. So, I, but um, certainly happy to answer any questions at the end or one-on-one or -on -one later on. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron, uh, my Centennial State partner uh, here from IMBA. Thanks, Fletcher. Uh, so as we're, 
what we've been talking about from here has been more on the, on a federal side, but not uh, not something that IMBA on a regular annual basis distributes a lot of information about. Uh, we haven't. We work on LWCF. We certainly work on these issues, but we don't regularly send out information to our our membership through emails and and newsletters. But the, the, the subject that I'm going to talk about, we do on an annual basis send out information and we house a web page, uh, a web page on our website that has uh, the applications and information there. So I was uh, surprised to see that only about 85% uh, have um, gone after these grants or maybe received these grants. Certainly can understand from the recipient side of it that there would be uh, less, but um, there's only so much money to go around, but I encourage you all to apply for it in next year's coming. So the National Forest uh, system trail stewardship grant program. It's money directly from the Forest Service that can flow to nonprofit organizations, specifically nonprofit organizations with 501c3 status uh, to do trail work and maintenance and deferred maintenance. Next slide, John. So as you can see on the top here, this is in a collaboration with the, the groups that are shown on the top of your screen. Uh, this was made possible in 2016 through legislation that we helped pass with a number of these groups, um, all of them, uh, working to kind of increase the, the agency's stewardship uh, capabilities and attention and also to uh, deal with some of the things that we were hearing from the field, which is volunteers going to the Forest Service saying we want to work on trails and the Forest Service may be saying that they did not have the capacity or the ability to manage that and actually turning volunteers away. So. Uh, that's not going to, the, the bill didn't solve that, but it's certainly going a long ways towards helping it. This funding, like I mentioned, is from the Forest Service. Uh, it's dedicated dollars from the Forest Service that goes out to these nonprofit groups through a competitive grant process. And it's for trail maintenance and reducing, specifically reducing the deferred maintenance backlog on national forest system trails. It in, you, you can apply for tools, supplies, supporting materials, as well as new construction of trails when it's needed for a reroute or some environmental uh, concerns. Grants range uh, each spring uh, from about 2,000 is the minimum for a project up to 20,000 as a maximum. And in 2021, we awarded out $550,000. That was just uh, announced in early May first week of May for work to be done in 2021. Uh, important to note is out of that $550,000 this year, about $290,000 went to projects that were uh, on trails that were open to mountain bikes, whether it was a mountain bike group or another partner group, one that you see up here, maybe it was the equestrians or other groups that were doing work on trails that mountain bikers can ride on at some point. So I would say, reach out to your local groups and thank them if uh, work is being done on your local trails or consider uh, partnering with them and other groups to apply for it next year. Success I'll just give you a tip here. Successful applicants tend to have about a two, greater than a 200% com combination of matching funds. That's like in-kind or cash or even federal uh, cash matches. They have high volunteer numbers. That's a, a scoring criteria. I'm on the scoring committee and have been for the last five years. And they are uh, uh, generally grants that are getting funded attack multiple uh, priority areas uh, for their trail work. Doesn't, isn't required, but it certainly helps within the scoring. They generally have a significant deferred maintenance mileage accomplishment, meaning that uh, you'll see 10, 15, maybe 50, or even up to 100, 200 miles of deferred maintenance being uh, reduced uh, through the, the, the field season, the stewardship field season. And it certainly helps to be in collaboration with multiple organizations uh, in your, uh, and demonstrate that in your application so that us as, as the members of the scoring committee can see that all these uh, groups are, being, uh, are working with other groups and therefore it's likely that it's a highly supported project uh, with a multi-use uh, benefit because we do score on the, the multiple use benefit of, of these dollars. Lastly, I'll say that uh, nearly 750,000, that's three quarters of a million dollars have been awarded to over 70 groups, specifically doing stewardship on mountain bike trails since the inception of this grant program. So if you're not one of those, uh, consider applying and getting your application ready for next year. You can visit IMBA's website to see uh, past uh, uh, program details and application guidelines. 
And you can certainly go to the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance who manages this program and look at their trails grant um, uh, application information so that you can be ready for uh, when the grant applications are released and then uh, meet the deadline and hopefully get uh, successful funding. I'm going to turn it over from there um, to Todd, I'm sorry, to Brenda of the Forest Service. And she's going to talk about the Great American Outdoors Act and the Public Lands Legacy Restoration and sort of the National Forest Foundation work in combination. So thank you very much. Brenda? Great. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, so yes, two specific programs that I'll be talking about. The Deferred Maintenance Fund that was authorized under the Great American Outdoors Act last summer. And essentially, as you can see on this slide, so the act authorizes additional funding to come to the federal land management agencies directly. And then those agencies can then in turn put some of that money into agreements to help fund partner organizations. And then the other um, program I'll talk about is the National Forest Foundation Matching Awards Program, which again, Forest Service funding goes into an agreement with the National Forest Foundation. And then they in turn um, run a national competitive process that nonprofit organizations can apply for those funds. Next slide, please. So before I get too into the, the nuts and bolts of those, I wanna talk about the structure of the Forest Service because it's really important for you all to understand how best to, where best to integrate and to talk with, with people to, um, to get involved in projects. And sorry, I don't know where this yellow came from. It just popped up a little bit ago. It's hard to see, but that says Ranger District. So. Uh, the where the rubber hits the road where the work is actually done on the ground is at the ranger district level and then um, there's multiple ranger districts per national forest or grassland and then there are many forests and grasslands per geographic region we have nine regions across the country and then we have our national office and that's the level at which i work and i don't know if i introduced myself i'm the national trail program manager for the forest service um, so, and then we're all under the Department of Agriculture. So again, keep these layers in mind because this is really critical to understand where the decision-making lies and where best to integrate to um, get your, your projects on the radar. Next slide, please. So this next slide um, shows the, just a schematic of the geographic regions. And you can see like region five, we, we call them by numbers generally, but they also have actual names as well. But um, region five is basically California, region 10 is Alaska, and then each of the other geographic regions are made up of multiple states. Next slide. So about the, the Legacy Restoration Fund or what we call the Deferred Maintenance Fund. Um, so essentially when with the passage of the GAO Act, um, that allowed 50% uh, of the funding that comes in from the receipts from oil and gas and renewable energy development on public lands, that is now into a fund, the Deferred Maintenance Fund that goes to these federal agencies to fund improvement of infrastructure. This is massively huge. So, um, and a huge thank you to our partners that actually lobbied to get the Forest Service as part of this law, because initially it was really focused on the Park Service. And so the Forest Service is allotted uh, up to 15% of the total funding under this Deferred Maintenance Fund. Um, that comes out to about $285 million a year for the next five years. And uh, what's great about, well, a lot of great things about this, but this is also no year money. So whereas normally our appropriations are just, you know, they, they turn into a pumpkin by September 30, this GAOA funding can go year over year. And we're really focused in the Forest Service on improving the visitor experiences. So the funding will directly go to improving trails, to, um, you know, improving campgrounds. Uh, the, the term deferred maintenance uh, is basically any maintenance that was required to have been done, but that wasn't done at the time that it should have been. So it was deferred or put off. And that's really what this focus is. Next slide, please. So some timelines for FY21 projects, the funding has been received from Congress and those are being implemented as we speak. So across the country, we've been hiring staff using GAOA funding, um, putting money into agreements to help fund partners to be uh, doing this work as well. We've already also selected FY22 projects and those are now being proposed. They have to go through the department for approval and then the office of management and budget and then ultimately through Congress. So we're awaiting approval before that. And then of course the funding for FY22 would come after October 1 when our new fiscal year starts. So right now we're actively soliciting project proposals from the forests 
um, that will be submitted to the regional offices by July of this year. So if you have ideas for projects that would be reducing deferred maintenance or maintenance that hasn't been done for a while when it was needed to be that improve visitor access and experience, uh, I really encourage you to talk with your uh, the contacts at the region or sorry, at the district level and um, let them know of your interest. And we're also encouraging people to be thinking more big picture about this as well. So the full suite of the road to the campground or the trailhead to the trail. Next slide, please. So um, I just briefly, well, let's skip this slide. I was just gonna talk about how you can get engaged, but I already talked about how you can talk with the districts about that. So the other program, the matching awards program and the website is there and I can also put it in the chat. Again, this is um, every January and June. So there's two different funding cycles and those are um, for uh, national competitive process. The dollar amounts can range from anywhere from $5,000 to $60,000. There is no actual cap. And um, the project should be no more than a year long and they're supposed to be shovel ready. So no planning needed, just get out on the ground and make things happen. So that's all for me, and I will turn it over to Paul to talk about some cost share agreements. Okay, how's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is Paul Stahlschmidt. I'm here in Boone, North Carolina. Um, I uh, am not a Forest Service employee. I, I'm a volunteer, 100% in the work I do for uh, trails. Um, I work for Appalachian State University in Boone, and. Do have uh, some recreation teaching to my to my position, and uh, some of this stuff I, I do take to students, um, so some of it's justified. But um, I, I just wanted to let you all know that. So um, you know, some of these things I'm going to share with you about uh, cost share agreements are coming from a, a volunteer perspective. Um, I did talk to our recreation uh, forester who, who I work with directly at our local district. And I want to echo what Brenda just said about like really going to the local district um, for guidance and, and kind of getting, getting all that done on the local level. I mean, as you saw from the map earlier, uh, we're in, in North Carolina, we're in region eight, which is very big. Uh, and we have a uh, MOU, uh, IMBA and SORBA both have an MOU with region eight of the Forest Service. And uh, this, these agreements that I'm going to talk about actually tier to that agreement. So um, we have a Region 8 MOU with the Forest Service. We have a sponsored volunteer agreement with, um, actually, you can go ahead and go to the next slide has some of this on there. So thank you. Uh, we have a, a sponsored volunteer agreement with our local district, which tiers to that uh, region agreement. And then underneath that, we have a, a challenge cost share agreement, which uh, um, it's kind of, uh, it's like a sponsor volunteer agreement plus uh, is the way that I put it on the slide, just because it allows for funds exchange um, between the Forest Service and, and your partner group, your club, your chapter, your nonprofit, et cetera. So um, it, it's critical for capturing year end funds. And uh, we all hear about there's no money out there, there's no money out there. But in our region, uh, our district gets some funds from uh, outfitter guide permits, uh, events. Um, we also have uh, some funding through restoration funds that are federal funds that sometimes at the end of a budget year, they're left over. And uh, we have a work kind of punch list that we can apply those to because our uh, sponsored volunteer agreement is in play for five years. So um, a couple other things about this, it requires a 20% uh, partner match. Um, we use volunteer hours for that. I already told you that I, I don't have any salary time at play, but I could uh, match that if I was paid uh, to do some trail design, uh, to do volunteer work, uh, to provide oversight to a project that's going on, that kind of thing. Um, but cash is a very good idea. Um, you know, we, we, our chapter, the Northwest North Carolina Mountain Bike Alliance, uh, we always put some cash in the pot because it kind of justifies um, uh, that this agreement has a lot of merit. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so yeah, if you're gonna actually hire a contractor, that's a good idea to have some cash involved as a match. Um, it's a very flexible thing uh, because the Forest Service isn't really hiring the contractors that work for us when we do this because it all tiers to that agreement. It's all spelled out in these agreements. Um, uh, you know, we can integrate volunteers uh, to lower the cost. Um, and this really isn't meant to get around the Forest Service contracting process, okay? So 
even though it's flexible and you're all probably thinking, wow, that's a cool thing. Uh, we can actually hire our local trail builder who's got a great rep with our, our mountain bike riders. Um, but it's really not meant to do that, even though it is that flexible. Um, uh, but it's justified when you can show that these volunteers um, or this organization, maybe you have a, a paid executive director, uh, you know, this organization has some serious expertise to this project. And uh, in addition to that, of course, it's justified when you have some added funding. Okay, so which is why the cash is a good idea to match with. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so as I mentioned before, it lasts up to five years. Um, there are some statements in there that need to be reviewed by um, a district ranger, of course, and um, you know your main contact uh, with our chapter. I actually get my president's signature on there, even though I'm the trails coordinator. Uh, I have our Travis, uh, our president, Travis Hutchins, has signed the most recent one. And uh, I do a lot of the work, but it goes through uh, vetting with my local club and, um, and our board uh, is very um, in tune with this as well. So it starts, um, you know, it starts with a seed project. Uh, we had uh, an SVA that, our cost share agreement, I'm sorry, that um, it actually started with the trail, one trail, and we ended up extending that um, CCS uh, for, uh, you know, three other trails or so that we worked on, uh, which I have noted at the very bottom. But you start with the seed project and then execute that. And then if that funding is available and you have a key project, which as we just heard about deferred maintenance just a minute ago, there's always deferred maintenance on Forest Service lands. So, um, you know, we have identified those and assessed those. We have a list, punch list, um, so we can apply uh, those to the next project. Um, uh, just wanted to give you a quick example. Uh, you can go to the Northwest North Carolina Mountain Bike Alliance website and see us bragging a lot about our relationship with our local district and the Forest Service. Um, we have timelines. We have all kinds of examples of how we got money for trails. Um, but one right now that's happening right this second is pictured there. That photo was just from about four days ago, five days ago. And um, it's called Yancey Ridge Trail. This project um, has you know, four miles of maintenance that's eliminating that deferred maintenance, uh, adding drains, you know, rolling grade dips, uh, a couple small relouts, re relocations that had NEPA done on them, and then one massive relo uh, of a mile, which is right there. That's the turn going into the massive relo, um, which was a poor line trail, had some private property involved, that kind of thing. But uh, at any rate, any rate we have uh, multiple partners. I mean, the theme for this is funding, but also partners are mentioned all the time. And I thought you all would be interested to see that we actually have uh, some partners that are hiking clubs and also TU helping us with some of our funding, uh, which might be a little bit weird, but we're really, really proud of that. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because part of this grant we have going on uh, is our responsibility. We're managing it through the cost share, but we also have some other things coming in. Um, so, uh, oh, and one more mention, you know, we, we got a large grant through Santa Cruz. I'm sure you, you saw some of that. Um, and that was really where we were able to really accelerate this project. Uh, it's part of a big project called the Mortimer Trails Project, which you can read about on our website. I can send you information if you want to. Um, but this particular trail uh, is the one we have the cost share agreement on. We have a lot of other funding mechanisms hitting the other trails in the bigger project. All, by the way, have had NEPA and it's all on the shelf. So whenever funding is available, um, you know, we're able to, to target these things through, uh, through funding. Our, our district ranger was very adamant that we don't go one trail at a time, that we actually come up with a big project, um, uh, get our uh, scoping process done and uh, do the NEPA uh, botany archeology span all at once. And then as funding becomes available, we can uh, hit it. And that's really what we're doing with this one trail, although we have different things going on uh, with the other. So. Uh, at any rate, we're really short on time. I know that was a crash course on this. I'm not a huge expert on this because I don't work for the Forest Service, but I did kind of vet some of this with our uh, contacts with our district. And uh, I'm happy to talk to you all about it later. I'm gonna turn it back over to Todd Keller right now. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, hey everyone, Todd Keller again. Uh, I'm the Director of Government Affairs uh, with IMBA here in Washington, DC. Um, I know that we're really short on time and I'm going to make some time up in the air as the pilots say uh, when you're flying across country, which none of us have done in quite some time. Um, want to talk, uh, could, uh, John, can you go to the next uh, slide? 
I want to touch on um, appropriations just very, very briefly. Um, we're in the middle of it. It's a yearly uh, an annual um, process that that uh, Congress goes through to basically federal, uh, not basically, but fe uh, fund the federal government. And it includes all of the land management agencies. And I've highlighted a few here. Um, and if you'll see underneath, um, like the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, National Park Service, on and on and on, um, those numbers for fiscal year 22, those are the president's budget numbers. So it starts with the president, um, the House Appropriations Committee, um, also starts to go through um, a budget process. And then they basically blend those two budgets together. And then it goes to the congressional um, uh, process where they fund it. Oftentimes they can't come to an agreement. So what they'll do is a continuous resolution and just adopt the budget from the previous year. It makes it much easier when the president and the house and the Senate are all in the same party. Usually when they're not in the same party, it becomes a very um, sort of a knockdown drag out type of, um, type of fight. But anyways, appropriations, we engage in appropriations. Uh, it is a daunting process. We learn something new every time we go through this and it can be very, very complex. Um, anyway, so uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide because I'm trying to get, get through this quickly. Um, and uh, I wanna talk about a little bit about legislative um, work that we're doing. And um, I have a good on a, a very, very good authority. The picture on the right hand here is the birth of mountain biking. Um, I think people uh, were riding down the Capitol steps on the bone shakers and they realized like this would be way cooler on a full suspension carbon bike and on trails. So I'm pretty sure that's exactly how it started. But uh, as we talked about RTP funding, um, there's the, and you can see it, it's sort of a small print, but it's the Recreational Trails Full Funding Act of 2021. Uh, this might be the most important piece of legislation that the trails community works on. Uh, we talked about the $84 million, um, Fletcher mentioned it a couple times. What this bill will do is almost triple the funding from 84 to between 250 and 290, depending on a report that the Federal Highway Administration will end up doing to figure out where the money is going and how much that's in there, those two things. So um, we work in a big coalition with Motorized and other, um, other interests, you know, the hiking community and everyone else. Um, because this is this will this is direct dollars to trails. A lot of the stuff that we've talked about today um, helps with other pieces to the trail ecosystem. This is direct, and uh, it's, it's you know again it, it might be the most important thing we work on um, uh, uh, to this point. That's not to say that this the other two pieces and there's a number of other pieces of legislation we also do, but these are the highlights. The Parks Jobs and Equity Act. We work with uh, the Trust for Public Land and Mike Bybee and I. Um, spend a lot of time working on that. And then there's the 21st Century Conservation Corps. All of these bills inject funding into outdoor recreation in one way or another. And you can, you can read the slides. And this is recorded, so you'll be able to go back on this. Um, and I will leave you with this. It is, it is clear that outdoor recreation is an investment worth making. It's clear from the agencies. It's clear from the administration. It's clear from Congress. And so this is one of the reasons we really wanted to do this webinar. And I know people, you know, this is drinking out of the fire hose. This is a lot of information. We're two minutes over already, um, but we're not going to we're not going to abandon you um, as far as that goes. We are going to follow this up with a lot of materials on our website. Um, depending on your feedback, we may even do a breakout of just RTP if people are interested in that or um, the cost share grants or something of that nature. So you can guide us to what information you really wanna know about. And then we can take a much, much deeper dive into how all of this works and, and what the, uh, the, the, the specifics and the particulars are. So I'm gonna end my piece right there. Um, and I'm gonna pass it to John. Uh, hopefully some of us can stay on for some questions. Uh, we would hope to get a, to a question answer period. Um, but again, there's a lot of information. So John, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone for a uh, great presentation. Like Todd said, it is like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, so we're going to transfer into a little bit of a Q&A. Uh, we can't answer every possible question, uh, but you will get a post-event survey coming out here soon uh, that will provide an opportunity for you to ask additional questions and we'll work on getting a uh, FAQ for federal funding uh, put up on our website and get that to all of you who have attended. Uh, with that said, let's see what questions we have. Uh, would love an RTP breakout 
think everyone would. Uh, we will be mailing, uh, we won't necessarily be emailing out the recording, but you'll get a link to a post event blog that will have the recording in it, along with those resources that Todd alluded to. Let's see if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. What is the easiest grant program to apply for the construction of new trails? I'll go ahead and mention that one thing we didn't talk about in this webinar is some of the stuff that IMBA has within our accelerator grant program and our big in grant program. So I would say that if you're looking at new trails, you might want to first start with working uh, to apply for those. You can uh, double dip, so to speak, and apply to multiple different uh, uh, processes and programs, including the ones that we have talked about today and uh, accelerator grants and big in campaign. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we have another question. Uh, out of the National Forest Service funding opportunities, uh, are those only available to serve national forest areas? Yeah, I can answer that. There's some nuances for sure. Um, in general, yes, if it's, um, you know, appropriated funding from Congress, then in general, that's to be spent on national forest system lands. There are some different agreements that we have um, like a good neighbor authority. There's some other authorities that do allow us to spend uh, forest service dollars on non forest service lands. And then also if we have easements that are in the forest service name, then we can spend appropriations on those easements as well. And there was another question, um, trying to keep up with the chat. There was another question about can cost share agreement funds be spent on NEPA and um, or be used to do NEPA. So typically, uh, and NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act, so it's basically a, the environmental assessments that need to be done in order to be able to undertake a federal action. So if we wanted to relocate a trail, we'd have to um, evaluate any potential impacts to wildlife or soils or um, those kinds of things. And so typically the NEPA assessments are done with our National Forest Service staff but there are some opportunities and actually it can be really helpful because sometimes we'll have a bottleneck if, if um, you know, there's only so many archeologists on the forest and we have a whole bunch of projects on the pipeline that need cultural surveys. That's where partners can really come in handy to, um, to move the NEPA process along. If, um, if partners can find an archeologist that of course, working in collaboration with the district uh, that the, that the, partners archaeologists could go out and do the surveys and then report back to the Forest Service archaeologists. That can really help to move things along because NEPA can oftentimes be the, you know, the hindrance to getting projects on the ground that can take a little while. So as far as cost share funding, so typically the cost share funding is, you know, Forest Service provides funding to a partner and then the partner could use some of that funding to help fund, uh, say, you know, again, an archaeologist to do cultural surveys. But you definitely want to, you know, work through your districts with all of that and make sure that that's on the up and up. Hey, thank you, and I Brenda. can't speak to the BLM on that, sorry. Uh, we had a question earlier in the chat um, in response to the nonprofits not being allowed to apply for LWCF. Uh, is this written into the federal language for the funding, or is it how states have interpreted and administered the funding? Who wants it? So, Mike, uh, you might want to answer that, but I would say that it's pretty much written in. It's uh, you as a nonprofit, you cannot apply for that, but you can work with your state partners to uh, have that money be put in towards projects that you're prioritizing and working on? Um, yeah, I think that's right. I would just simply add that as, as, is, <clears throat> as has been mentioned earlier at the beginning, um, I think Laurel mentioned that that, that on the ground partnership with, with the federal agency is key to that, um, you know, working with them to identify uh, trail projects or needs. Um, and then yes, um, as was also mentioned, you know, identifying potentially a, a land trust partner on the ground to help facilitate that process 
um, like the Trust for Public Land or the Conservation Fund or the Nature Conservancy. There are, there are several, um, but I would I would simply suggest that those partnerships are the are the key. Um, on the ground. Yeah, and and I would add a lot of the legislation that we are currently working on. Um, a transit to trails bill that would um, fund transit programs to get people from urban areas to the trails. Um, all of that is not available to nonprofits directly, but it goes through that same process where a governmental entity, entity and then you as a nonprofit partner with them. They can't do that themselves. They're going to need the, these partnerships. And if you have been on a couple of our government affairs webinars over the last few years, we've really, really stressed in advocacy is these partnerships are so, so, so important. And I, I will always say that. And I know Aaron has said that in the past as well. Um, and that's how really these things get done is through these partnerships, so. And I could just add a real world example of, of you know, just how critical partners are with the LWCF funding. So along the Continental Divide National Scenic Trail down in New Mexico, we were able to secure 5,000 acres of really sensitive riparian habitat, which as you know, it's New Mexico, so that was a pretty big deal. And the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation um, purchased the land and then the uh, some partner organizations helped to staff up and, you know, and get the documentation and, and photos and everything together working with the Forest Service. The Forest Service, or actually, sorry, it was the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, put in the application and got the funding and then was able to purchase it from the partner. So it was multiple entities. So the Forest Service administers that trail, Bureau of Land Management was actually the one that purchased it. And then um, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Colorado Trail, um, or sorry, Continental Divide Trail Coalition. So there's just, I mean, the, the opportunities are endless when you partner together and figure out who can do this piece and who can do that piece. You certainly cannot go wrong with more partners. Uh, it can only help you. And uh, when, when things really maybe even go south in the future on some other issue, uh, it's good to have those partners to be able to call upon and uh, you know, work things out. I see another question about um, ideas to reduce the USFS staff burden of accepting volunteers. Partners say paperwork processing is onerous. So that is definitely something that is on the radar. And I can say with the, the trail program, I'm fairly new in this position. I started last fall in the, in the permanent position as the national trail program lead. And um, there are a lot of things on my radar to be working on in the coming years. And for sure, one of them is um, identifying what are those barriers to being able to more successfully and efficiently and effectively engage volunteers and partners on the ground. We have a lot of partners and volunteers that are eager to engage, but as you say, there's you know process, you know paperwork issues or other things that are barriers, or maybe we don't have the capacity at the local district to be able to adequately give them the support that they need. So that's uh, very much a combined focus of the trails group um, and the wilderness, any basically any of the field going staff that work with volunteers, that's, that's uh, you know, coming in the coming months to be really taking a focused look at this and what can we do to help streamline things and, and uh, just make it work better. And, and Brenda, I will say that um, one of our asks from, from legislators um, has been uh, money for the Forest Service for staff and for, you know, that capacity building, um, because we know those roadblocks happen when you know we're we're chomping at the bit to get these done, and it hits this roadblock, and you you all don't have the capacity. So that's one of the things we've been working on from an advocacy perspective, not just IMBA, but Outdoor Alliance and a lot of our partners um, collectively together doing that. So that's excellent. And I'll just say part of that what what's on my mind is we need to as the agency to be able to um, demonstrate what it takes to manage trails. You know what are the foundational pieces and, and that we need and so that we can clearly identify where those gaps are as well so that we can more kind of intentionally and strategically go after filling those gaps so um you know yeah i think that but that's wonderful to hear that you all are working on that yeah, thanks uh, it looks like we had a request for kind of a flow chart um we will be putting out a fact sheet uh, along with the presentation and blog uh, that will kind of show you a snapshot of who's eligible, uh, who to contact and how to apply and the amount of money available. So we'll definitely have that coming out soon, Carrie. 
All right, if we don't have any other questions, we are a little bit over time. And so, like I said, you'll get a post event survey and you'll have an opportunity to ask additional questions that we'll try to get together on a, for an FAQ that will be posted up on our resource hub on Imba's website. So stay tuned for that. And thank you all for joining in for this presentation. Yes, and thank you to the speakers. Really appreciate it. And again, we know that this was a lot of information for everyone to digest. And again, hopefully this, this you know, elicits questions and uh, you guys can guide us on what in your interest is moving forward. There is a lot of money out there for trails and this is really our time to really capitalize on that and uh, build this great infrastructure for mountain bikers. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Appreciate everybody.